All right. Thank you guys all so much for coming. And have your questions ready in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if I have any instructors on the call with me yet. Oh, yeah, I see Ellen's here. Ellen Sloss is here. Um, and usually we have a few other instructors join me. Um, that way we can make sure all the questions get answered. I'll do my best to keep up um, over audio answering your questions and addressing them. Um, but in the chat, they can be addressed as well. So thank you in advance, Ellen, for helping me keep up with the questions. So in your last milestone, you left off at the price, elastic price elasticity of demand section. So the, this milestone is going to cover the remaining three sections of your paper. Um, and the first one is costs of production. So cost of production um, has two critical elements in it. So there's two particular things that you're tasked with that you're going to be graded on in this section. Uh, and the first one asks you to analyze the various costs your company faces, their trends over time, and how they've impacted the company's profitability. So there's kind of three facets to this one. So first of all, you have to know the costs that your company faces. And you know the reason that we want you to do that is because every company has different kinds of costs. Uh, General Motors is going to spend money on steel. Uh, Netflix is going to spend money on um, intellectual property rights for um, the, the shows that they contract with um, and then making their own shows. So very, very different, very different set of costs depending on the kind of company that you're looking at. So that's the first thing you're going to talk about. You're going to talk about how the, the price of those input costs has trended over time. And then you're also going to look at how that's impacted the company's profitability. Sorry, my dog is asking to go out. I don't know why she wants to go out in the snow, but she's crazy. So, and yeah, it looks like there's some questions on where to get this. So RG writes income statement. Is that the same as financial data or financial statements and support data? Yes. So the income statement is going to have information about revenue and then right following that, and usually it's in the same table, um, is information on costs. So it's, it's often called COGS. So you can see here, COGS is generally uh, capturing the very the variable costs that a company faces, whereas operating expenses tends to be uh, more of the fixed cost side of things, which we're going to talk about a little bit more for the next critical element in this section. But that's for a very rough guide, for our purposes here, um, you can use that sort of as a shorthand. Um, in your discussion, you'll want to get into a little bit more detail, but when you're looking at the actual numbers, um, that's going to give you a, a good guide. So Donna, so that's a great question. So Donna asks, so we can use the income statement to analyze the trends over time, or do I have to research the cost of raw materials? Donna, I would say both. So you're going to show the data from the income statements, right? You're going to show the COGS um, and the operating expenses, and that's provided for you. I mean, you already, everybody already has the um, these statements because you had to get them for the revenue stuff from last week. So you're going to share that, and then you're going to talk about what you see. You know, are they going up? Are they going up really fast? Are they going down? Um, and you're also going to need that to talk about how it impacted the company's profitability, which is often called their net income on in that section of the annual report. So you're definitely going to need to talk about the overall trend that the company has in terms of costs, but it is helpful to look at specific costs. So like the GM example, the cost of steel, the Starbucks, you know, the cost of coffee beans. Um, things like that. So you, you want to take it that one step further to really do um, a strong job here and get and earn full credit, not just on your milestone, but on your final um, your final draft. Did anyone else lose sound? So Christine, the the income statement itself won't tell you what the raw materials are or what their costs are. But that is something that you'll generally see discussed in the business and risk factors section of the annual report. And a lot of times it's just, depending on the company, it's very obvious. So you know that cars are made out of steel and they've got tires and they've got glass windows and things like that. Um, you know that, you know, a company like, um, like Southwest, an airline company has to buy airplanes from another company like Boeing. Um, and they also have to buy jet fuel. 
So some of the things can be fairly obvious, but if you're unsure, definitely, you know, read back through their report and see what they talk about. Um, and if you're still unsure, after you've done some research, you can reach out to your instructor for some guidance. Right, so if I was doing a company like General Motors, I could just, you know, do some simple research on the price of steel. That's a traded commodity. It's very easy to find data on that. Same thing with coffee um, or milk, or you could even look at labor prices uh, or wages. Um, if you if you need to talk about that as a cost that your company faces, if your company uses a lot of labor, um, you know, like a Starbucks has to employ a lot of people because they've got, you know, thousands of stores, that might be something you want to include. So you could talk about wage rates. Um, all that stuff is available out there and, and you can just do a little bit of research and none of that stuff is difficult to find. So the Usually students tend to do a pretty good job. You know, the cost stuff is right there in the annual report for the overall costs. Um, drilling down into some of the raw material costs generally isn't a problem. What students tend to forget is the impact on profitability. Um, I think it just happens to be an oversight. So definitely make sure that you include that in your paper. So the trick to this is, you know, costs can go up. And oftentimes they do be only be because the company is growing. So you need to produce more stuff. So of course you're gonna incur more costs. You know, if you're Southwest and you're flying more people around, you're gonna need more planes, you're gonna need more jet fuel, but that doesn't mean you're less profitable. So it's really important that you look at it all together. So um, I think the best way to look at profitability is not even just the dollar number. So you see that net income number, but to look at it uh, in terms of percent or a ratio. So you can look at the ratio of revenue to profitability or the ratio of cost to profitability to show is, you know, are costs increasing faster than profit or are costs increasing uh, less quickly than profit? And in some situations, you might see a company that's not growing. Um, your company might be shrinking. I think that's the case with Coca-Cola over the past couple of years, if I remember correctly, from papers that I've read from previous students. Um, you might see their costs going down. Um, and perhaps their profit is going down, but the profit ratio is still pretty good. Um, it's just they're not selling as much, but they're still very profitable. So those are some of the things to consider when you think about the profit, but you'll see the number and you can, you can get a sense for that, that ratio. So which one's going up faster, um, costs or profit, or which one's going down faster if they're both decreasing. All right, are there any questions about um, this critical element before I move on to the next one? Okay, don't see anyone typing, so I'm gonna continue. Um, and just like with we, what we did with revenue, try to include at least five years of data to get a good trend. Um, so the second element is asking you to apply the concepts of variable and fixed costs to company to your company for informing their output decision. So what does that mean? That means how do they decide how much to produce, what to produce, where to produce based on their costs. So for a company that has a lot of high variable costs, their, their decisions about what to produce and how much to produce is gonna be different than a company with high fixed costs, for instance. And it depends what those costs are. So if you think about a company like, you know, if you were, running your own restaurant um, and the price of cheese increases and that's an ingredient in your stuff. Will you continue to sell a lot of things that include cheese? Maybe, maybe not. But you have to take that cost into consideration when you decide what items to put on your menu and how much to charge for them. So those are the kinds of things we want you to think about in terms of your company and what they've done. So a lot of times a company will switch raw materials um, or try to begin switching to raw materials. They might try to find a new supplier um, if costs are increasing. Um, when it comes to the fixed cost side, generally with fixed costs, you're trying to spread those costs out over as many customers as possible. So the goal there is simply to sell more, maybe to enter a bigger market. Um, so a company like Netflix has lots of high costs. So it's important for them to get more members to appeal to more demographics, 
perhaps it's important that more people have smartphones and smart TVs because then it makes it easier for them to be Netflix customers. Um, it's important for them to break into countries like China that have a lot of people because then they can spread fixed costs out um, even further. So those are the kinds of things you're going to look at. Again, it's going to be different depending on each company. Um, and certainly very different if the company has more a lot of variable costs versus a lot of fixed costs. So RG asks, is a coffee drink technically a fixed cost? That would be a variable cost. Um, so the coffee itself, you know, every time I make a coffee at my coffee shop, I need to buy more beans to, to make that coffee and more milk to put in the coffee and more sugar to put in the coffee. But the store would be the fixed cost. Yeah, and even the barista, you know, the person pouring the coffee, that's, you know, a variable cost. The more coffee you sell, the more, and the more hours your store is open, the more people you need working there. So those are all the, the variable costs that go into, like, a coffee shop or a restaurant. I mean, most companies have a mix of variable and fixed costs, but some are going to be weighted more heavily to one than the other. Lori, to, to a certain degree, uh, electricity is a fixed cost. So if you have a store, you could not have any customers that day, but you had to have all the electricity on. But there are companies where you're running machinery that uses electricity. So if you're running fewer machines, you're using less electricity. Or if you're open fewer hours, you're using less electricity. So there are some that don't always neatly fall into to certain categories. Or there might be a a minimum amount that you need, which is the fixed cost, but anything above and beyond that is variable. So I don't think for most companies, electricity is that any of, most of the companies that you guys are doing um, would be a, a big portion of it. I know that like steels, like smelting is a very high electricity operation and they try to do it in um in Iceland because energy there is so cheap because of all the um, the thermal energy. So that's a, that's an industry that has really high electricity costs or, you know, maybe if you're trying to like make Bitcoin <laughs> or grow marijuana in your basement. But for most, even for like a Starbucks, I don't think electricity is a big driver of their costs. So that probably wouldn't be something that you're spending time talking about is my point. Um, but if your if your annual report mentions electricity costs, then that must mean it's important. So if you found it in the annual report when you were reading about risk factors, then you know if they found it important to mention, then it's probably important for you to talk about too. But I I suspect that most companies that that you guys have chosen that's not the case. All right. Um, Donna, I think it's I personally think it's easier as the instructor to gauge that you've addressed both of them if you do them separately. But um, it, it, that doesn't mean you can't address them together. Definitely if you're using if you're using the language, you know, the economic terms, that makes it much clearer. If you're talking about these are the variable and these are the fixed costs, um, then it's going to be clear to your instructor that you're addressing that portion, even if it's mixed. If you're talking about trends in the input costs and how that's affected profitability, using those words, those terms, then it's going to be, it's going to help your instructor know that's what you're addressing. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's one of the reasons we have this outline is so that you know to break them up because it, it, it makes your job easier in a way because, you know, you've, you're, you've been given an outline and you just have to follow that instead of organizing your paper, figuring out your own organization for the paper. And it definitely helps with um, the reader's understanding of the paper and the grading. So, all right. Um, since we have a lot to cover, I'm gonna keep moving on, but feel free to you know post any questions as they come up, even if they're not about the section I'm talking about. So the overall market section, this has three, um, three critical elements that you're gonna be writing on. Now I do want to preface this with there is there are some aspects to this 
section of three elements that we haven't fully developed in the class yet. So we're starting our look at market structures this week. We're looking at two of the four market structures um, and we'll finish that next week. Now you are introduced, um, there's a table and, and I'll talk about that in a minute in our textbook that outlines each of the market structure types. Um, so you are introduced to them and you get some of the characteristics, but we won't really get into the nitty gritty of the other two until next week. So if, if in that introductory table that talks about the different market, different kinds of markets, um, if you find that yours is one of the ones that we cover next week, um, you might just want to do a little bit of reading ahead. Um, but it shouldn't be a problem. Great, and we, I believe, is it linked here? It might be linked here. So, well, any, either way, the, um, the first critical element here is about market share. So market share is often confused with stock share price. So that's the first thing I want everybody to not do, is to not go out and research the, the share price for your company. Uh, market share is essentially the slice of the pie that your company has for the, the market. Um, your company might be in more than one market, so you might want to look at different market shares, but let's say we'll use the Southwest example again because that's very neat and clean. They are an airline company. They are in the, the air travel market for people who want to take flights. That's the market that they're in. What percentage of the market do they have? Um, there's a few different ways to look at it, and when you do your research, you, you'll find that for a company like Southwest, you could say, of all the people, of all the flights, of all the miles flown, how many are Southwest miles, of all the revenue in the airline industry, how much is Southwest, do I just look at domestic, do I look at worldwide? Um, so you want to define the market and then figure out how big the slice of the pie is for your company and then for their competitors. So if I was doing Southwest, I would probably look at U.S. airline revenue. How much revenue is there for all U.S. You know, domestic travel? And then I would show how much Southwest is, how much Delta's is, how much um, United is, so, so on and so forth. All right. Oh, and yes, uh, William mentions that IBIS World is good for market share, and that I believe was one of the um, one of the sites that our library webinar covered. I believe because that sounds familiar from that from that webinar that we did. Um, so a lot of times students struggle to find this data um, just through a simple Google search. For some companies or in industries, it's really easy. So for the airline industry, for the automotive industry. This, this data is out there, it's very easy to find, it's easy to find for many different years, uh, but that's not the case for all industries. So you might need to use the Shapiro Library um, to get stuff that's often like behind a paywall or just not available through a regular Google search. All right. So when you do this, um, an important part of this is to find a trend. So you want to know, is your company gaining ground? Or are they losing ground? Are they staying the same? Um, you know, like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, the, you know, the, the cola wars. Who's selling more this year? <laughs> you know, who's winning? Um, whose market share is bigger is essentially what that question is about. That's what the cola wars is about. Um, how, how is the pie changing for Pepsi and Coke? Um, you'll need at least two years of data to show that. So let's say you can get information for 2017. Okay, well, how does that compare to 2016 or to 2014? We need to know, did their slice of the pie get bigger or smaller? Um, so that's why it's important to, to not only get data for the most recent time you can find, but also to get something from a previous year so you can show the trend. Um, RG, that one's a little tricky with Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts and McDonald's, um, but there is research out there on it, so I would just follow what the research does, because there are other people in this, you know, who, who are doing market research um, who have asked that same question. So, 
Um, if you follow up on research that's been done, you can sort of tease that out by piggybacking on their work. But yes, yeah, those are definitely the, the companies that they're competing with. Um, I mean, definitely to a smaller degree, you have like um, Pete's Coffee and stuff, but they're not nearly on the same scale as Dunkin' and McDonald's compared to Starbucks. All right, um, so that's how we do market share. And once you get the numbers, part of um, doing an exemplary job for the final is to show this graphically and over time. Showing it graphically is, is pretty simple. You can make like a simple pie chart. Um, I think that's gen generally the best way since we are literally talking about shares of a total. Um, it, but some students also do other kinds of graphs or tables. Uh, but that's pretty easy to do since you already have the data and I don't want anyone to forget it if you already have the data and then you can be getting full credit on the final portion. All right, so the second element here um, is asking you to look at the barriers to entry for your firm's industry. So barriers to entry, we've got a link to that here that's covered in chapter 14 more in more detail, um, which I know is ahead from next week. But it's a very small portion of the chapter, so it's easy to, to go ahead and familiarize yourself with um, for this for your writing here. The biggest mistake students make here is that they think about the barriers to entry for their company. But remember, your company is already in the market. They're already in the industry that you're talking about. So you're looking at barriers to entry for newcomers. So if you are operating, if I have a, a restaurant in town and I want to know, well, could somebody just like come in and open in a restaurant and compete with me? What's keeping them from doing that? Well, in the restaurant business, not a whole lot. There are some barriers to entry in the restaurant business. You know, you have to get approved by, you know, the city or the town. Um, generally, it's just more about local regulations. But beyond that, you know, a restaurant can just pop up right next to me and sell the same things you know, very similar menu items to me. So that's something I would have to be aware of as, as a business owner in that industry, that there are low barriers to entry and somebody could come in and, and try to undercut me or copy me or steal customers away from me. Um, some industries have higher barriers to entry. So your company might be a little bit more insulated than my hypothetical restaurant in town. Um, and you can look at the ways that newcomers are kept out or at least kept from being successful or growing big. Um, so the coffee shop example is a good one. I mean, my cousin opened a coffee shop in Cambridge last year. You know, that's not really such a big deal, but it doesn't mean he really competes with Starbucks, not at not on the on a global scale. And for him to do that on a global scale would be a Herculean task, and it probably won't happen. Um, but he can open up one coffee shop. Yep, so Lori says, could it be a copyright? A copyright is a great example. So if, when you look at the barriers to entry section, you see lots of things that revolve around legal barriers. So patents, copyrights, lots of stuff involving intellectual property. So pharmaceutical companies, um, that's a big one for them. They usually have patent protection on new drugs for you know a certain period of time. So let's say like 10 years. Is that what you meant by copyright? Did I, did I miss the conversation, Lori? <laughs> it would be a barrier to entry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you know, other barriers to entry are simply just scale. Um, and, and, you know, capital sometimes can be a barrier to entry, having enough money to, to get big enough to, to operate in that context. Um, branding can be a barrier to entry. So sometimes it's just hard to overcome people's you know, knowledge of, oh, this is a brand that I trust and I know and I like, so I don't really want to switch. So like with, um, you know, that's a common thing with Coca-Cola and Pepsi. You know, why are there only two? Well, they're pretty cheap products and they have a very sophisticated distribution network and they have really strong brands. So it would be hard for somebody to come in and compete with them on price and also on name recognition and the quality associated with that. So, um, so those are just a few of the barriers to entry, but we have a link to it here. You can do some of your, a little bit of your own research. 
So what you're going to do is you're going to talk about these are the barriers to entry. These ones are low for this industry, high for this industry. This is and this is how it impacts my company. So maybe my company is very vulnerable to new competition because of all this, or maybe it's not very vulnerable or these are the ways that it is or is not vulnerable. Um, so the last rubric element in this section um, asks you to describe the market structure for your firm and analyze how this affects their ability to influence the overall market. So this is the section that I was talking about. We've got four different market structure types and you're doing two this week. Perfect competition. That's where everything is identical. So like corn and soybean farmers. Um, the other one you're doing this week is monopolistic competition. Um, and next week we cover in depth oligopoly and monopoly. Um, if you have a feeling that your company might be an oligopoly or monopoly in one or more of the markets that they operate in, um, you might just want to read ahead on those bits. But we there is a table in Chapter 12 that gives some overall description of each of those markets and the characteristics. So check that out. Um, we also have a link here on some empirical work you could do to, sh to help you show which market structure type it is. So the easiest one um, is the four firm concentration ratio. So we've got that linked here. And you can simply talk, do the four firm concentration ratio and whatever number you come up with. Um, that will help you decide where it lands within those four market structure types. So um, the four firm concentration ratio is simply looking at for the top four firms, the top four companies in an industry, what their market shares add up to. And if they add up to a certain to a certain threshold, then they would be considered like an oligopoly. If they're below a certain threshold, then they would be monopolistic competition. Amy, yes. Recommendations is the last section. I'm about to get to that, so I'm probably going to need to borrow a few minutes from Eco 202. Um, this section, the recommendation section, students um, tend to do a pretty good job on. The biggest thing to note here is that each of these elements in the recommendation section are meant to tie back to work that you've done in the paper. So the the first one, develop a recommendation for how the firm can manage its future production by synthesizing the data presented. So this is asking you to go back and reflect on the cost section and the supply section. So that's managing its future production. That's it's referring to that. So this basically the supply side. So the cost is, is the supply side and obviously the supply analysis that you did last week is part of the, the supply and production side. So you're going to take sort of what you found from there and, and use that to help you make some recommendations. Um, and then further, the next one is asking you to suggest how the firm's position within the market and among its competitors will allow it to take the actions that you recommended. So this is where you need to know things like what their, what their market share is, how big are they? That, that kind of indicates how powerful they are and their position within the market, how many competitors they have, what kind of market structure is it. Depending on the market structure, companies have to behave in different ways, um, which, which we're reading about this week and next week. So you're going to make sure that you tie it into that, that overall market section. And then lastly, you're asked to describe how the firm can su sustain its success going forward by evaluating trends in demand and price elasticity. So again, this is going to ask you to reflect back on the demand and price, la price elasticity section. Um, so maybe you found a trend in demand that um, indicates that they should do something specific and you can talk about that. Um, and in the price elasticity of demand section, you found a specific uh, pricing strategy that they should, that they should go towards um, based on you know, how customers would react to a price change. So you'll want to reflect on that here as well. So everything that you write about in your recommendation section should be able to tie back to your earlier writing. That's the biggest thing to remember here. All right. I don't, right, and Ellen gives a great suggestion. So if you have this like awesome idea, like I think that Starbucks should sell kombucha. Maybe they should actually, that's pretty good. Idea. Maybe they do. <laughs> I think that Starbucks should sell kombucha, but you've not mentioned kombucha in your paper. 
you, you should probably go back and mention it. <laughs> mention, hey, demand is rising for this, uh, this, this tea, this fermented tea called kombucha, and I think Starbucks should sell it because it's getting super popular among millennials, and millennials are this huge growing demographic, and they finally have all this disposable income. They should cater to that trend and demand and sell kombucha. It only makes sense if you've talked about all those things about kombucha first. They're selling wine. Oh, that's crazy. Not in Massachusetts. <laughs> My Whole Foods still doesn't sell wine. Or if you talk about them, they really need to reduce the costs of this raw material. But you didn't talk about that raw material cost at all in your cost section. That would be sort of a disconnect. So um, if you find that you want to talk about that in your recommendation, absolutely, you can go back and add it. Maybe make a note. You know, it's your instructor that you added some things because um, they might remember from your paper. She didn't talk about kombucha. Where'd this come from? Um. <laughs> I can buy wine, just not at the grocery store. <laughs> right, Walmart, close to, it definitely is easiest to probably classify it as the retail industry. Um, you could also, and, and groceries. You might want to talk about retail and groceries separately. Retail typically also includes apparel. Um, usually when they talk about apparel companies, it's about the actual producers of the apparel who, who make it, not just who sell it. So like JCPenney sells clothes, but they don't make clothes, right? Nike makes clothes. Um, Levi's makes jeans. But I buy... I can also buy jeans at Sears. So when you talk about apparel market, that's the difference, right? Um, whereas groceries, grocery stores don't grow the food, they just sell it. Oh, that's a great company. Yeah, I've been thinking about adding that to, um, to the list. I think it's on my second list. <laughs> I, don't, I haven't read a paper on it yet, though. I'd, I'd love to. Do they manufacture something other than apparel? Yeah, Christine, I can see Verizon being tricky. Um, all right, if there are no more questions, I believe we probably have some Eco 202 students waiting. But hopefully this was helpful. If you have any questions between now and um, Sunday, please, as soon as you can, email your instructor. The sooner the better so that they can get back to you quicker and you've got time to, um, to work, given their, their feedback. Um, check out that Shapiro Library webinar recording, um, especially helpful for the overall market section. So take it you know take advantage of that um and yeah just read you know read through this guide and read through the sample paper you know as you do your own work to sort of get a sense of the of what to include oh amy you'll be okay like i said read, you know if you're unsure about something just reach out to your instructor we don't get we don't get enough content questions honestly Thank you, Ellen. That's where all our recordings are. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. And thank you to our Eco 202 students for waiting patiently. You all have a much shorter milestone this week than your 201 counterparts. So I'm sure you're not sad about that. All right. It's okay. They'll probably all have to take 202, so it evens out. <laughs> Thanks, Marie. Okay, Andy, are you talking about the one I'm showing right now, or are you talking about the one for Eco 201?
the PowerPoint. Okay, so the one I'm showing right now. So this is the PowerPoint. This is the version that I'm showing is the same exact content as what you have in your class, um, but it's just a different background slide template um, because SNU updated it, but not before the course is rolled. So this was sent out right at the end of the year. Um, but to get this, you go to your course, you go to your course, you go to the course menu in Brightspace up in the top left hand corner. You go to learning modules and then you go to start here. I hope you're writing this down because it's a few steps. <laughs> so you go to start here. And then once you're in start here, if you scroll down within start here, you'll see um, an area called assignment guidelines and rubrics. This is in assignment guidelines and rubrics area. So if you click on that, you'll find it. You can even try it right now to make sure. Because I want to make sure everybody has a copy of this or can access the copy that's been provided to you. Because it's definitely in the classes. Yep, so, so you go to course menu, learning modules, start here, assignment guidelines and rubrics, and this is called, I believe, the final project guide. If I remember how they titled it, the file in Brightspace. Yes, Nat, I just haven't advanced the slide. <laughs> this is where we left off from last week. So hopefully, so Christine and Andy, were you able to find it just now? You got it? Awesome. Okay, great. It is um, very useful. All right, so last week we did fiscal policy action, um, which I hope you guys found super interesting because there's been so much fiscal policy news making in the past couple months that, you know, you can really start to put this stuff to good use. Um, with the tax, the tax plan that was passed and the upcoming um, spending plan, this is, you know, a great, a great exercise in thinking about um, you know, why this stuff is being implemented and, you know, what the effects will be, what the desired effects are. It's very cool. It's a cool time to study macroeconomics. Yeah. So what are you going to do with that extra $70? That's the question. That's what we studied when, um, I forget, which week was it? Uh, week three or week, f must be yeah, week three, the uh, marginal propensity to consume. So you're going to spend it all on gas money. <laughs> right. So some people, depending on your situation, are going to spend all that extra tax cut money out in their local communities or on gas. I don't know if that's the way that we want our money to be spent when we look at macroeconomic policy, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, some people are going to save a portion of it. Some people are going to save all of it. You know, depends on depends on your situation. Yep, some people are going to pay off previous spending, which is you know, sort of in a way a kind of kind of savings. You're not spending it in the local economy, so. But anyway, it's it's lots of great stuff to think about. So I think it's very exciting. I, in a way, I'm a little bit sad that I'm not teaching macroeconomics this term. But, say la vie. So we are doing monetary policy. Um, so monetary policy, it's actually a little bit exciting right now. Not much has changed, except we do have a new Federal Reserve chair. And Andy, do not ever tell me that again, that you bought lottery tickets. I had, <laughs> it's going to sound terrible. I had a, a professor, an economics professor, who said that lottery tickets are a tax on the poor <laughs> because poor people, lower income households tend to be the purchasers of lottery tickets. And since it's money that goes to the government, it's kind of like a tax. It's to me, that was silly because it's not like anybody's forced to buy lottery tickets, but it always stuck with me. And, um, and I hate gambling anyway. So, and my parents love to buy lottery tickets. They love it. And it's always the hit at the Yankee swap. I don't know if you guys do Yankee swap where you live, but everybody always wants to scratch tickets. Andy, are you in Florida? Oh, 
I didn't know Oklahoma did that too. That's cool. Um, all right. So, um, monetary policy. So we, we're learning about that this week. I know it's only Wednesday, so you might not have, you know, finished, maybe not even started the chapter reading. But monetary policy is uh, sort of the flip side to fiscal policy. So fiscal policy was um, the federal government's taxation and spending policy, um, generally aimed at some sort of economic outcome. Monetary policy is our central bank's role in that, how they manage um, the money supply and interest rates in order to meet these goals. Numbers one and two are their main priority, price stability, so looking at inflation um, and maintaining high employment. And then secondary to those two things is economic growth and financial market stability. All important, but what they mostly focus on is, infl is uh, inflation and unemployment rates. So those are the, the general things that they look at. Um, we did just get, like I said, a new Federal Reserve chair um, that may or may not bring swings in policy. Uh, we will find out. We will see. Um, usually it's not quite as drastic as when we have change of hands with the White House or with Senate or Congress. Um, this tends to be a little bit less political, which is why it's the central bank is purposely kept separate from the federal government. Um, you know, it's, it's an independent bank, but still there are different attitudes and thoughts about um, what the bank should do in response to what they see in the economy. So when you get a new Fed chair, um, it, it can mark a shift in, in their policy approach. So Camilla asks, how is the San Francisco Federal Reserve helpful? I don't see anything for our PowerPoint. You mean the link? So, so the Federal Reserve, uh, the San Francisco, is the link not working? I just want to make sure I understand your point, the, your question, rather. So they happen to have a lot of research on um, Fed history, like, and, and Paul, the, you know, their policy history, which is why I included that link. So that's the thing that San Francisco Federal Reserve focuses on. Um, the St. Louis Federal Reserve is the is the location that manages the FRED database that we all know and love. Atlanta does a lot of education series and a lot of videos. Um, I don't know what Boston is good for. I'm up here, drive by it all the time. I don't know what I don't know what their specialty is. Oh yeah, and Atlanta focuses on exchange rates. Well, New York is sort of the head, so I think they do most of like the general policy making. Philly does general research. Yeah, but either way, the San Francisco Federal Reserve has a lot of uh, Fed history research on it. So, but this, Marie, so when you say you can't find the years, are you referring to this last link? For the um, Federal Open Market Committee? Or, Marie, are you saying you can't find the years on the San Francisco site? Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's just one. So the San Francisco site is just one option. Um, and you might, I don't know if, if it's that easy for there to search by years. You might have to search by a specific, like, policy action. Or, again, you might want to search by Fed chair. Um, but that's just one site that happens to have some research. Um, the last bullet point here should have, it has transcripts of meetings from, every year. So that one is, is very comprehensive. So that should have, have everybody covered. And then of course, um, you can also do research through the Shapiro Library beyond the links that we have here. Right, so if I recall correctly, the San Francisco Federal Reserve has papers, so research papers dating back not not terribly long, 
but some of those papers cover policy from previous decades. So it might be a little bit more difficult to find than the Federal Open Market Committee where you can just search by year. Great, yeah. Yeah, a lot of, um, A lot of interesting stuff going on at that time, for sure, with the, the oil crisis. Yeah, if you do a little bit of research, so that's, so like we talked about with the fiscal policy, if you watched or joined the webinar um, from last week, if you just want to say, okay, well, what were the, what were the, the big policy decisions? How am I going to find what those were? The easiest way to start is to look by the Federal Reserve Chair. Just like with fiscal policy, you would look by the President. Um, because that's kind of how it gets discussed, you know. Janet Yellen did this, right? It was obviously the entire Federal Reserve. It's not her decision alone, but because she's the chair, that's, you know, who they attribute it to, just like with the President. So that way you can do a little bit of research, just general Google search to start, if, if that's the easiest. If you look up their Wikipedia page, then you can probably find some of their policy actions. And once you sort of have a good understanding of, okay, these were like the few things that they did and when they did them, then you can actually do your scholarly research to get good information on that stuff now that you know what the stuff is. So, um, when you go to the Shapiro Library, that's probably what you'll type in, either the Fed chairperson's name during that time, or um, if you've already found out some stuff about their policy actions, you can look specifically at you know, the, their policy actions and look up those. So just like with our, excuse me, just like with our first fiscal policy um, element, our first monetary policy element that you're graded on is asking you to just sort of lay the groundwork. This this is what monetary policy looked like at the start of my decade. So that's typically what the Fed was doing in terms of um, targeting the interest rate. That's you know generally how it's um, how they operate. Um, they have a few different ways to target that, but that's that's sort of the end goal. Um, a lot of this stuff is you know like I said, it's very easy to find um, in terms of what that target rate was, and you've got your transcripts and other meetings, and you have the Fed funds rate as well, um, going back as far as you need to. So that, that data is pretty easy to come about. But then you can give a little bit of discussion of, you know, why that was the case. Why were rates at this point? Had they, had they been brought up? And that now this is where they are at the start of my decade. Had they been brought down because of this happened in the economy? And that's why they're here at the start of my decade. But either way, you're sort of laying the groundwork at the, at the first year, let's say, you know, 1980, I'm doing the 80s, 1980, this is what it looked like. And this is why it looked that way. So that allows you to look at all the changes that take place and why. And that's what the next slide is about, just like fiscal policy. So now, now that you've sort of said, this is how things began for my time period, then you can say, this is how they changed. This is how they evolved over the 10 years. Um, so you can see from the meeting minutes that we talked about on the last page, the Fed meets regularly and makes adjustments, sometimes quite frequently. They're, they're generally small adjustments, um, but they're always looking at how they're going to respond to all the changes they see in the economy, whether they see prices gradually increasing or decreasing, if they see um, unemployment rates changing in some way, they see wages moving up and down. These are all the things that they respond to um, and try to target an interest rate that they think matches the economic conditions um, and helps maximize price stability and high unemployment. So when you talk about their actions, you're going to say, okay, well, this is what they did. This is why they did it. And this is how the model shows that. So very, very similar to what you did last week. So I see Marie is typing. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, I wish I took economics in high school too. The high school, 
and the town I live in now has economics. Uh, they have AP economics actually available. Um, and it would be my dream job to get to teach there, teach econ there. But <laughs> maybe someday when the teacher there retires um, and I can stay adjuncting for students. Right, but I get to write my own course, Ellen, so it would be awesome. <laughs> All right, so it doesn't sound like there's any questions about this. Um, just like before, if you want to draw, you know, using some of the like the line tools um, in PowerPoint, you want to draw, you know, the aggregate demand, aggregate su supply model. That's a great thing to do to show expansionary or contractionary policy and the effect that has on um, price level, on GDP slash employment. Um, here, you could also look at um, the supply and demand of money model. So that can explain sort of the mechanism by which the Fed's tools work. So, you know, the Fed does these open market operations. Well, what does that mean? Well, they, you know, they, they buy and sell things and in doing that, they're injecting money into the economy or they're taking money out of the economy. So how does that change in the supply of, of money impact interest rates? That's what the supply and demand of money model shows us. Right, this is, so Kristen, if you want to use the supply and demand of money model, it would be here, not in fiscal policy, because the Fed is basically in charge of the money supply for, you know, all intents and purposes. Right, so when they do their open market operations, um, they're, like I said, they're either putting money into the economy, you know, making deposits in banks, and now banks have more money on their books, or they're, they're taking it away to decrease the money supply. So you would be showing a shift and that supply curve, and then that, and then you see how that impacts interest rates. <clears throat> Marie, are you asking to do over to pick a different decade? Oh, good. <laughs> I was gonna say that sounds crazy. <laughs> I would not recommend that. Um, so I think. We're good on this, the particulars of this critical element. Um, again, it's it's very similar to what you did on the fiscal policy one. If you want to talk about a handful of different policy actions, because you know ten years is a long time, you can um, spread that out onto different slides. Marie, I, I always check with your faculty about stuff like that. Generally, I haven't found that to be a problem with students. Um, or I certainly don't dock them for it. But your, your presentation should not be 50 slides long. If it's approaching 50 slides, then maybe find a way to combine or cut. How <laughs> you are. <laughs> well, I think the, the, the way that students get to have a ton of slides is um, and I think I call this like the TED Talk phenomenon, is you put in like a slide that's just like a picture to be cool, but you're not present, you're not actually presenting this to anybody like you would if it was a TED Talk. So those don't add a lot of value um, since you're not up in front of a group of people clicking through slides. So you want your slides to be really focused on the information. So, you know, your graphs and your data and your bullet points on the slide and then the explanation in the speaker notes. Yeah, right, but even if you have a lot of graphs, I mean, for the most part, you can, you know, like for policy actions, you might have three separate slides, max, if you want to talk about three drastically different policy actions. Um, I think more than that, and you could probably have combined some of them. Yeah, the, spe the speaker notes being long, that's not going to really affect the length you know, your slide length, certainly. You might be overdoing it and then, in a sense, not making efficient use of your time. But, you know, you can see what kind of feedback you got from Milestone 1 on the on the, um, the notes. And you can always email your instructor, like, hey, how, how did my speaker notes look on, on Milestone 1? Did you think they were too long, too short? And they can give you some feedback if you're worried about that. Because they might have just said you did an awesome job, 
but if you wrote 10 times as much as you needed to, they might not have called that out specifically. So you can always double check. All right, and one thing to note, um, it does say here on the last bullet point, scholarly research is required here as well, um, as it is in the, the previous one. So, you know, when you're talking about these are the actions the Federal Reserve took, you obviously had to incorporate some scholarly research to know that, right? To explain the models, that's your learning. That's from our textbooks. So you're not going to be, unless you're borrowing a graph from some source, you don't have to cite, you know, I know how to apply this model. That's you. That's your knowledge that you're bringing here. But um, saying, oh, you know, the Fed took this action to, you know, make this the target rate and they did X, Y, and Z, um, that has to come from your research. So, you know, make sure you're citing it. And then you can go into some detail um, in your speaker notes about what, what that action looked like from your research. All right. And the last one is the monetary policy impact. So the Fed has taken all these actions, um, adjusting the money, money supply to have an impact on the interest rates. Um, how did those play out? Did they have their intended effect? Were they big enough? Were they too big? Were they timed well? Um, how did it affect households and businesses? Um, you know, there's a, a great example uh, in the early 80s where inflation was so high, and anybody who's doing this already knows this because you already got your charts from milestone one. Um, so to combat that rising inflation, they increased interest rates quite a bit. Um, and it did, in the end, bring inflation down, but it also had some other consequences in terms of, um, you know, impacting people's ability to get mortgages or buy cars and, you know, generally created an increased cost for businesses that led to um, a recession. So those are some of the things that, that you can look at in terms of the impact. So in that case, you know, the Federal Reserve met one of their goals. They, they got, you know, the price stability goal. But on the other side, it, it had a negative consequence for economic growth and employment. Yeah, that was crazy. I mean, you know, I don't know how old everybody is. And we have people of all, of all ages here at SNU, students and faculty. Um, but it was, it was very traumatizing um, for folks who went through it. Um, and you see a lot of that with our policymakers. So generally our policymakers like at the Fed are, are older, you know, because they're very experienced. And so they live through that time. So there's a, a huge fear about inflation. Um, whereas folks that are younger, you know, under 40, haven't really lived through that. I mean, you know, there are children when that happened or not even born yet. So for most of our lives, um, inflation really hasn't been part of the story, or at least high inflation hasn't been part of the story in terms of the economy. So to fear it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to, to, the, to that demographic. Yeah, it was definitely real. So, you know, that's sort of where the, the history bit comes in, which is why I think it's great to, you know, looking at all these different decades and, and learning about this stuff. I mean, I know each of you only picks one, but um, it's fascinating to see the history and to see the, the different policy approaches um, and how the economy has evolved in all this time. Yeah, and I think by 1984, they had already started to come down, if I recall correctly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, my like the rate on my student loans is so low that I don't even bother trying to pay them off fast. I mean, it makes more sense to leave my savings, you know, invested than you know, in my retirement fund than it would be to pay off my student loans because the return on my retirement account is way better than the interest rate I pay. But that hasn't always been the case. So there's a lot of rhetoric out there about, oh, paying down debt and having debt is bad. But in a low interest rate, low inflation environment, 
it doesn't, it's not as salient. Yes, uh, Marie, there will be a webinar for the final project in two weeks. Um, there, there are going to be, just as a heads up, and I know we're one minute over time uh, and we've covered everything, but um, there will be four new elements to cover. So we aren't, because of the way that the chapters fall, we aren't able to cover everything in the final project um, by week five. So the two slides um, on foreign trade, which come before fiscal policy in the guide. If you look at your paper outline, this exactly follow, I'm sorry, the project outline. If you look at the outline in the rubric, you'll see that um, this stuff is part of the first section on the, on the data, the data section. So you'll be adding these two slides and we'll cover foreign trade next week. And then the conclusion slides um, are added for the final project as well. So those are at the end. Yep, and then references as always. Any other questions um, before I let you guys go? So Andy, just be aware, it's not actually a milestone. So you're not, you don't get a chance to resubmit. So those are the only four slides that you're just submitting for the final draft. Um, and you're, everything will come together. So it's gonna be all the slides that you've done and then these, those four new ones. So it's gonna follow the outline of the project exactly. Um, you, you already got feedback on almost all of your slides, just not those, those four that I just mentioned. Um, so you, hopefully you make some improvements to those slides based on your feedback. You add those four new ones, and then that's your final submission. One big, not 50 slides long PowerPoint presentation. Next week, where you, you cover the final trade stuff. You're not submitting it yet, but you're, that's when the chapter reading is. It's not due, I'm sorry, it's not due until week seven though, the, the final project. <laughs> sorry if I misspoke there. So Marie, we're going to have a webinar in, in week seven, which is in two weeks from tonight, because that's when that's the week the final project is due. Sorry for confusing you. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> 